Timothy Snyder is already waiting. Uh, I know that there is quite a few of you who would have loved to have him here because for many of us, he is a hero. He is for me because I remember that many, many years ago when he got the Hannah Arendt Prize in Bremen, uh, he offered a seminar and that was shortly after he had written Bloodlands. And this book is such an eye opener. It is, I would say everybody who enters the German Bundestag or any political parliament, at least in Europe, should read Bloodlands because then you understand. Uh, Timothy is already listening. Um, Timothy is a professor of history and global affairs at Yale University, but he stays in Vienna most of the time, I think, at the Institute for Human Sciences. And uh, like I said, he has been written, writing a lot, but Bloodlands, for me anyway, personally, still is the main uh, opus. <laughs> And uh, it's so many years ago that he wrote it, and it's unbelievable that all the traces he has been following are now showing up again. That is what we call the long lines of history. So uh, we will hear from Timothy about the traces, about incitement to genocide, what it takes to prepare the road to then kill people and try to exterminate a whole people. And then we have, we are uh, glad to have uh, Sir Adam Roberts. I don't see him at the moment. Ah, there he is sitting in the back. Okay, very modest. He's a senior research fellow in international relations at Oxford University. Uh, he has been the president of the British Academy. And uh, he has been, I think, like uh, Gordon Wayne, uh, given expert and advice to parliaments, and committees, to governments, and to public inquiries. So. We are really happy that uh, you made this long way with the nasty airports we usually have. So thank you all very much. Uh, Timothy, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Mary Louisa. Uh, thank you all for being there. I'm very glad to be in the, in, in the company of, of Adam Roberts, um, who was uh, one, of, one of the people I learned from when I was a graduate student. I, I, I asked to speak about the question of intention because it seems to me that in this discussion about genocide, we are in a very odd place. It seems to me that the, the genocidal intent of this war has been clear even before the war itself began, that the proclamations that Mr. Putin issued at the very latest in July of 2021 were openly genocidal and that the language that he used in the days running up to the war was also clearly genocidal. It, it troubles me, and I'll just say this at the beginning, um, that, that the countries whose constitutional orders, Israel and Germany, and whose everyday political rhetoric are very much tied up to the historical fact of the Holocaust have in general been so slow to recognize what I take to be the obviously genocidal character of this war. And uh, I'm not speaking of societies now, but speaking of governments, have done so little to hinder it. Um, there's, I think there's a particular sadness in that. But let me take my time to make my, my argument about intention. It seems to me that in the discussions of intention, um, which of course is necessary according to the Genocide Convention of 1948, people get pushed back to a kind of naive construction of human nature where the, 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 the posture is something like, we need, we, we need to get inside that person's mind. And then the next move after that is to say, well, of course we can't get inside that person's mind. And by that, in that way of seeing things, 
the entire 1948 genocide convention and indeed the idea of genocide itself becomes absolutely meaningless. If intention is something that can only be somehow produced by an x-ray of someone's mind, then obviously there's no such thing as genocide. So as a historian, I just want to make the point that the way we arrive at judgments about intent has to do with the contexts and the discourses and the, the, the circumstances. Um, we, we can't expect to find some kind of clear x-ray. Um, this is even true, of course, in the case of Adolf Hitler. I, I presume that everyone would take for granted that you know, the, the anachronism aside, the, the Holocaust of the Jews was an example of genocide. But one would be, I think, hard pressed to find the actual order or the actual moment where you could say, literally, um, here is the moment where we know what Hitler's state of mind was. The case for the Holocaust, the case of the intention is built up from, by historians on the basis of circumstances and statements and, and conjunctures, which is what we have to do in real time as well. Now, I say this not because I think Germany uh, now and Germany then and Russia now are exactly the same. I say it because I take it that Nazi Germany is an obvious case of genocide. And my point is that even these obvious cases of genocide, if we apply the standard of looking into someone's mind, we're, we're never going to find what we're looking for. So let me just take um, a few minutes to supply what I think are um, a handful of pretty good historical indicators of genocidal intent. And I think these things are useful because we can draw them from cases where we've had more time to contemplate what's happened than the eight months that we have with, with Russia. And then once we, once we take them from history, we can apply them more quickly and perhaps come to the conclusion to which I believe we, we need to come. The first, um, the, first, the first indicator of genocidal intent one could draw from colonial history, and it would be the description of a state as not a state. In general, colonial powers, when encountering uh, other political units, did not recognize them as states, and that was generally the prologue to an indicator of a, a coming genocide. A second indicator comes from the 20th century, and that is the description of a people as not a people. A society is not a society, a nation as, as not a nation. So a social group is encountered, but it's not recognized as, as such. A third indicator also coming from the 20th century, but of course also there, there are examples from before, but the, the third indicator would be the denial that people are human. So you encounter individuals, but you claim that for one reason or another, they're not actually human beings. A fourth indicator that we have from the late 20th century and into the present is retrospective. It's when people deny that a previous genocide has taken place, which in fact means that they desire to commit the genocide or the kind of genocide they're talking about. The obvious example here would be neo-Nazis who deny the Holocaust. And of course, the meaning of that is not that they factually deny the Holocaust. The meaning of it is that they desire such an event to take place. Another indicator now moving from history into the present or into a theory which is decades old, but which is very much present around the world now um, is what we now call replacement. The idea that other people are coming, they're taking our space, um, they're replacing us and therefore we're right to replace them. Something like that was actually very present in the Nazi view of the world. And it is also very present as I'm going to claim in Putin's view of the world. The final indicator, which is very much from the present day, not historical, but which I think is worth mentioning because without it, it's hard to understand contemporary Russian practice. The final thing which is worth mentioning is a postmodern indicator. The postmodern indicator is that you, you overload the system. You basically supply so much evidence of genocide, both in, in theory and in practice, both in statements and in deeds, that people begin to ask, um, well, is this really genocide? And I really, I, I realize that might sound paradoxical, but I think the problem of anything today is not that there's a lack of evidence. I think the problem of anything today is the overabundance of evidence, both in terms of the, the perpetration and in terms of the intention. And the very overabundance leads to a kind of perverse cycle where people think, I'm not sure this is genocide, and then they say, well, there's all this evidence, but therefore to, be, to convince me that it's genocide, I need still more evidence. 
And that cycle can continue indefinitely. And, and the standard for what genocide is, is then indefinitely raised. And I believe that's what's actually happening. I don't think the genocidal practices, and I'm sure this has been discussed elsewhere, are really in doubt. Every single practice that's mentioned in the second paragraph, of the 1948 convention has obviously been, been carried out. And, I, I, and I'm sure you all know that in the 1948 convention, it's not just the genocide itself, but it's also incitement to genocide, which is listed as a crime, um, just as much as a crime. So all of the practices are there. I assume that that's pretty clear. I'm happy to talk about it later. What I wanna talk about is how these six indicators of intention are, are clearly evident in, um, in, in, in the events of the last eight months or even earlier. So the first thing I mentioned is the colonial indicator the denial that the state is a state. Putin has been denying that Ukraine is a state since at least 2011, um, very clearly in 2013, before the run-up to this war in 2014. There was an onrush of such rhetoric in 2021, including a very long and specific essay. Um, and during the war, there's been a systematic refusal to recognize the Ukrainian state as such, to recognize the Ukrainian government as such, or to recognize Ukrainian officials as such. And the way I'm putting it is very euphemistic. In fact, there's a systematic practice of applying abusive language to all institutions that might be Ukrainian. The second in indicator from the 20th century that I mentioned is the denial that a people is a people. And here, of course, Hitler provides a very good example with the discussion of the Jews. In Mein Kampf and elsewhere, Hitler describes the Jews as not being of this earth. They're not attached to the land. They don't belong where they, where they are. And this is actually strikingly similar to the way that Ukrainians are discussed by Putin and in Russian propaganda generally. The notion is that in Ukraine, there are real people and those real people are Russians, but somehow they're governed by a thin layer of exotics, of people from elsewhere. Propagandists refer to these people variously as having been Poles or Habsburgs or Nazis or Jews or Europeans. It doesn't really matter though. The theory is always the same. The people who call themselves Ukrainians are somehow from elsewhere. They don't really belong on the land. They are servants of an international conspiracy. Their loyalties are somehow elsewhere. And from that theory, it follows that if these people can be exterminated, then the natural order will, will be restored. The right people will be on the land and they will un understand themselves the way that they belong. That of course is, it, that is the logic of Mein Kampf actually with respect to the Jews. And it's a logic on display on Russian television today. Um, I, I'll point to the, the, the recent appearance of Pavel Gubarov when he spoke of exterminating um, as many Ukrainians as had to be exterminated. This is the logic. We exterminate all the ones who think they're Ukrainians until we get to the point where we reach the people who actually understand that they are Russians. The third indicator from the 20th century also is the denial that people are human. Um, and here I'll, I'll stay with that same clip from, from Pavel Gubarov, or I could also mention um, the ending of a recent propaganda program, uh, the most important one led by a man called Solovyov, where we are confronted with the idea that Ukrainians are possessed, that the reason why there is Ukraine is that people are possessed by the devil. Now, this might seem like it could be something that's easily sub s dismissed as laughable, but it is pretty widespread um, in Russian discussions of Ukraine. And one even finds it very prominently in the fascist theory of Ivan Ilin, who is a thinker who Mr. Putin has cited consistently um, over the last decade or more, and most recently on September 30th in his speech about the referenda. In this idea, um, Ukrainians are actually you know, servants of Satan. Um, this notion, of course, is very deeply rooted in, in Russian Christian nationalism or Russian Christian fascism, where, of course, Satan is associated with the Jews. So here we have an actual Nazi idea. The fourth criterion that I mentioned is the retrospective one the denial that a genocide took place. And again, there's abundant evidence of this. Um, the, the memory laws in the USSR, which forbid people from speaking of the 1939 alliance with Hitler, were strengthened right before this war began. The official, um, the official policy on the Holodomor in Ukraine um, has been strengthened as this war has gone on. Um, a, a, a monument to Holodomor, as I'm sure all of you know, was just brought down in occupied Mariupol 
the gist of the Russian argument about Holodomor is that there couldn't have been a political motive. It was simply a natural disaster or some kind of administrative exercise. Meanwhile, even as Russians are saying this, they're trying to cut off water supplies and cut off power supplies so Ukrainians will suffer and, and die in the millions. Um, when you deny that there's a political motive in the past, you're also denying that there's a political motive in the future. You're just saying that everything is natural and going the way that it should be. Number five, is, is the contemporary replacement theory, um, the idea that we are being replaced by, by others, by other races. Putin himself is an advocate of this. His anxiety about Russian demography is well known. Replacement theory is all over the telegram channels of Wagner, who are the people who are actually fighting um, much of the war in Ukraine. Wagner, of course, is a, it's a private mercenary group. They're fighting around Bakhmut. They're the ones who are trying to carry out an offensive. Um, and I should note that in this replacement theory mode, the genocide that we're talking about is not limited to Ukrainians. Throughout the course of this war, males from the indigenous peoples of the Russian Federation, of, of the Eastern Russian Federation, the Southern parts of the Russian Federation, have been sent in hugely disproportionate numbers to die on the front. Meanwhile, um, women and children from Ukraine have been deported into Russia on the theory that they, that they are white, quote unquote, and therefore they can be assimilated into the Russian population. So there's, a, there's an attempt at reversing what, what fascists see as replacement. A specific idea, a specific example of this are the Crimean Tatars, the indigenous people of the Crimean Peninsula, who, um, of course, were subject to many waves of, 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 of deportation. Finally, in the spring of 1944, under Stalin, every single last Crimean Tatar was deported. Since 1991, many have returned. But under the current Russian occupation, they're specifically targeted for oppression and right now specifically targeted for mobilization so that they can go and die elsewhere in Ukraine. Um, so there's, there's a genocidal element, I believe, to this as well, which goes beyond the Ukrainians. But the final point I want to make and to repeat and to close is, is the postmodern one, number six. I think that Russia, as it does in other matters, is deliberately overloading the system. It's trying to make things hard to understand just by throwing too much evidence at it. This takes place in a certain, it, it takes place at a qualitative level when, um, when Russians claim that, uh, that saying that, that Ukrainians are Nazis, this of course is just, is, is, is confusing, but you know, at its root is itself a fascist practice because it divides the world into us and them. Um, it's a fascist practice in the sense that it simply hate speech. When Russians refer to Ukrainians as Nazis, they just mean these are non-human people who deserve whatever they get. Um, with the denial of the state, it's much the same way. There's so much of it that we lose our sensibility to it. And, and the, same, the same is true, I think, with the actions. There's every day there's some action which violates the genocide convention. And I'm afraid that we become, we become jaded. Um, we, over, over weeks and months, we, we, our sensibility is dulled and we just expect more and more. Um, so my, my final point is that we, we, have to be, when we, we have to be very careful that we're not falling into some kind of perverse cycle. The, the evidence for intent here is, is very clear. By historical standards, it's very clear. It's unusually clear. And I think if anything, the danger is that because there's so much evidence of intent, we'll keep stretching and reaching and, hope, and, and expecting that something even clearer will be delivered. But it's, 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 it, in, in my view, it's been, it's been very clear for a very long time. Thank you very much for your intention. See, uh, the interpreters really had to work hard, I would say. <laughs> so many ideas and in such a short time.